Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge where tonight's event is taking place. We are on the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. We are very grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community and to support First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities by showing the works of Indigenous filmmakers here at TIFF. Hi, I'm so thrilled to be here and uh, it's such a pleasure to present this cut of my first film. Um, it is, it's the way that I intended uh, the film to be seen. So when I, when I finished the film, this was the cut that I had had, uh, that I locked picture on. And, uh, you know, I thought I had kind of dropped the mic and was done with it. And then um, things happened and um, I had to go in and recut it. Um, you know, there was some a disagreement in, in, in uh, the way the cut should be presented. And so I went in and did the release cut of the film, um, of which I am also very fond. However, um, it was a very emotional process, um, and we can talk about that after the film. But, uh, but this was the film that I intended the world to see. So please enjoy it. Thank you. Um, I wanted to, to begin by asking you, when you watch Eve's Bayou now, what, what endures the most, what feels the most current or present for you now? Uh, it's, so, it's so emotional for me because, um, you know, it's a story very close to my heart. I mean, the characters are very close to my heart. I think, uh, God, it's so hard to say, but I mean, I think the character of Eve endures for me. Um, she, she's, 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 she's me in a lot of ways, and she's also kind of, um, Scout from To Kill a Mockingbird. I mean, she, she's based on on literary characters as well, um, but but the but she feels very real and present to me. There is something literary about it. There's so much great fiction from that part of the South, and uh, just the the idea that the truth changes color depending on the light. Mm -hmm. uh, is something that you find, I guess, more often in, in literary fiction than in films, because films are often so much about good guys and bad guys, and it's not quite so simple in this film, is it? Well, that, that was the whole point. To me, the question um, was more important than the answer to the question. It was like, what is really real? Or if two people remember something differently, what's the actual truth? Um, there's a big difference for me in this version in the answer to that question or, or in the question itself. Um, but uh, yeah, it's meant to exist on a couple of different levels. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about this version and the, the additional footage that, that you added? Yeah, so um, in the original film, I have an unanswerable question. Um, and in, in this version, the answer is contained in a person who can't speak. So that there's a witness um, who, who who must know he was there, has observed what happened between these two people, but he, he's a mute witness. So, so I intended there to be a truth housed in someone that, that couldn't um, express what the truth was, you know? Uh, but in what I kind of like about the release version, honestly, is that there's no truth, you know what I mean? There's no truth. If two people remember something differently, what's the truth, really? Who's the point of view? You know, and it's like kind of like the, the tree falls in the woods, you know, like it, it, it brings up all those questions like what is reality if we, it, it, it's memory, you know what I mean? It's memory because we can't go back there and we can't prove it in any way. And so in this version also, they, they couldn't prove it. There's no proof to be had, but there was a truth. Um, and that's, it's a huge difference, but it's a very short amount of film that expresses the difference between the two cuts. But it's a huge difference to me um, that there was um, there was an actual um, there was a place where truth was located. So that sounds like a fairly critical um, point or, or you know plot element in in the story. How did you go about deciding to cut that out for the original release version? Um, it was it was it was <laughs> it was kind of. Um, strongly suggested to me. <laughs> oh, I hear that in Hollywood sometimes they strongly suggest <laughs> it's, it's things. Very, it's very strongly suggested, and um, and I uh, had to wrap my mind around it. Honestly, we, we were very traumatized. Uh, those of us who had participated in the film and cut the film 
were very traumatized by that decision. And also because Hitomi was there, there were, it was an autobiographical film and definitely not. So it was both fiction, but drawing on my, my, my childhood. And, um, but Uncle Tommy was a character of, he was a real person in my life. He was my great uncle. He had cerebral palsy or I, I, I think. I'm not even sure. Not diagnosed. Well, I'm not sure. He was just uh, somebody that was on the third floor that we had to say goodnight to. You know, he was a person in the house. And that's very Southern and very, um, I mean, it's very, it's it's families, you know, especially in that time period. And very, um, there was something very American and very Southern and very African-American about that to me and very Gothic at the same time, you know. Um, and... So it was real, you know what I mean? It was real. So uh, when we when we had to cut him out, my my post crew uh, made a T-shirt with an empty wheelchair that said, "Where's Where's Tommy?" You know, it's <laughs> good. You look at that; it happened now. That would have gone viral. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, can you talk a little bit about the release of the film? Uh, how was it received? Um, what was the kind of the range of, of re reactions to it? Well, we, di we didn't have any idea. It was really hot from the lab because I had, um, you know, I had thought I had dropped the mic on the cut before on this cut. And then we had to go back in. And so this, the, the release cut of it was hot from the lab um, when we started, fr frankly, when we came here. here right. And um, so I didn't really uh, know what the audience response was going to be. And then we got this kind of tremendous response from the audience. And then a few like key critics that were here, Roger Ebert was here. And so um, the great, right? And Roger Ebert um, had such profound and deep and real genuine love for the film that he expressed, you know. Uh, so and that that definitely helped, and, but but critically we did incredibly well, and the most exciting thing with audiences is that we cro it crossed over completely crossed over, mm -hmm. like it completely crossed. I think fifty one percent of the the audience was African American, you know. Okay, and it played south, north, east, west, all across. Yeah, it North played. America. It, was, it was the most. Um, it it made it was the highest grossing independent film of nineteen ninety seven. Fantastic. Yeah. So you've made a number of other films since then, and I know you're doing lots of other work as well, including an opera. Um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about that period in the 90s, because there was so much going on. You know, Spike Lee was maybe a decade into his career. There were all kinds of other filmmakers cropping up. You were making your films, and, and, um, and it felt like that was a bit of a moment for African-American filmmakers in particular. And then that changed, and now it feels like there's a resurgence again with a new generation of filmmakers. But what happened at that time that, that kind of created this critical mass of filmmakers? Well, um, there, there were some very interesting people working and, um, you know, all of us are mostly still working, but it, it was some filmmakers that came out of the box and Singleton and Spike and um, uh, Tillman. And, you know, there were, there were lots of movies that people got very excited about. Um, Boys in the Hood, people got very excited about Soul Food. People got, get, the people were very excited about these movies, but, you know, one of the first um, women filmmakers that everybody got excited about was Julie Dash. And so, the, and, and Spike, I mean, it's hard to explain now that we have seen so many of Spike's films, what it meant for us to see She's Gotta Have It when it first came out. It was like all of a sudden there was a different language in this kind of, uh, this way of telling stories that was completely different and wasn't trying to serve anything but his vision. And so that kind of like, I can serve my own vision mentality um, that was so inspirational for film, because Daughters of the Dust was the same way. That was a wave that that I felt that I rode. So even though, you know, in some ways, uh, I was one of the, the first um, of the women filmmakers, I, I was still riding a wave of people that, that were creating films before and around me, you know. And I, I think of it as a wave. I think of it as a huge wave that um, I thought was going to break and that kind of subsided <laughs> and then developed again and developed momentum again. And now I think we're really feeling, you know, this this huge push. But certainly I thought we were on the brink of something then that was going to, the world was going to change and, and um, the future was going to look different. And when it didn't, uh, it was disillusioning. And 
and frankly, um, not that easy to sustain a career, you know, for, for many of us. Um, it just wasn't, we weren't fashionable anymore. And, and I've got to say there, there's an underlying fear uh, of that happening again. Yeah. Um, but I think it's just because I've been around, you know what I mean? <laughs> no, but I mean, yeah. I, I think that, that- There are cycles sometimes. Yeah, there's cycles sometimes, but mm -hmm. I think there's reason to be extremely optimistic right now. Mm -hmm. So you did break ground for a lot of filmmakers who came uh, afterwards, Ava DuVernay and so many others who are making, women who are making independent films now. Um, how does it feel for you now to see this new wave of uh, films by women, uh, to see what the results of Me Too and Time's Up have done, not just in terms of addressing sexual harassment, but in terms of just opening doors for women to tell their own stories? Because your work has always been by and about black women and girls. Um, yeah, it, it, certainly I always hope to lead by example, um, but I also took a very active role in um, trying to educate uh, the generation of filmmakers that was coming up, um, you know, after me and not just educate like I know something they don't know, but really finding what I might know that they don't know, you know. Um, teaching is a wonderful way to kind of quantify what you know. Um, that you might be able to offer, but also offering by example and by example of just being present and, and looking somebody in the eyes and saying, you know, you can do this, you know? And so that's been a, it's a big part of my, I mean, it's very real. It's a big part of my life. And um, so I've, I've actively mentored with um, Sundance Institute and I'm a professor at um, Tisch Grad Film School. And it's been, I've taught all over. I've taught it all over at AFI and UCLA and USC and, uh, most of the major film schools, and it, it's a big part of my life. So it became kind of a mission um, at a certain point. I don't know, I don't know that I always dreamed of having this these kind of goals. I mean, I think that at one point I, you know, I wanted to be a famous actress, you know, <laughs> um, but, but my life took these turns and brought me to a place. The day that I realized that it was rarefied what I had done, that I really realized that and really felt it in my bones was the day that I, thought I have to change this and I have to um, be part of, of whatever the future is that allows this full expression of all these artists that I had met. You know, I would meet people that were trying to do this thing, you know, how can I be part of um, helping mm -hmm. this move forward? You mentioned acting as well. And of course, you have done a lot of terrific acting uh, in addition to directing, including in Silence of the Lambs, mm -hmm. uh, one of your uh, your signature roles, I think, mm -hmm. uh, in that film. And I wonder also having, you know, directed Samuel Jackson and, uh, you know, such great actors over the course of your career, what does that training as an actor give you as a director? How, does it change how you speak with your actors? Yeah, it definitely changes how... Um how, how I speak to actors, because I had had a variety of directors, so I had had directors that were very good at talking to actors and directors that were not at all good at talking to actors. Who are those? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you the ones who were good in, okay. in their own way. Uh -huh. um, Spike was good in his own way. Um, John Woo in his own way, even though the film that I did with him, he did not have much English at that time, mm -hmm. was still good at communicating, you know, and it was a different kind of communicating. Um, Jonathan Demi, wonderful. You know, so I had worked with some directors, some very, very good directors. And, um, and that, it's not that I thought about it while I was um, working with them because I was too busy trying to figure out how to hit my marks and act at the same time, you know, like most actors, you know, in movies. But um, later I thought about it. So later when I got on a set, I thought about how did I want to be as a director? And I, I thought about Jonathan Demi and I thought I wanted to be as excited and cool as he was. Excited, but not frantic at all just like excited and focused. And that's what I thought. I thought I want to be excited and focused and present. Mm -hmm. And I want my conversations with actors to be intimate. And, Even and in that's the middle of all from. the hundreds of people yeah. on a movie set. Mm -hmm. huh. um, I want to open it up to uh, you in a moment. So if you've got questions, please get them ready. And I think we will have microphones, yes, uh, on either side. Uh, just one last thing before we open it up to the audience. I wanted to ask you a little bit more 
about Harriet and about telling that particular story. This is, of course, uh, a, a critical part of American history. And, and many of us would have been reading the 1619 um, series of articles in the New York Times recently, repositioning America as a country shaped by the slave trade and the enslavement of Africans. Uh, and of course, Harriet Tubman being one of the, the key abolitionists and, and real freedom fighters. Um, can you talk about telling that story, which we're gonna see at the film festival, uh, making its world premiere in our gala section very soon in a couple of weeks time. Can you talk, talk a little bit about wanting to make that film and, and, and why you wanted to tell that story? Well, I mean, at first it was, it was daunting, frankly. Um, it was daunting. It's it's a, it's an idea. Some of these, some of our heroes in in every culture, I'm sure, you know, they they they're an idea. And how do we make that um, present? How do how do I bring her to us so that we feel like we've had lunch with her? You know, we feel we feel that we've been in the room with Harriet Tubman, and so that was a huge challenge. And and I, it's something I took very very seriously. And so, um, you know, in my preparation, I read everything about Harriet every major scholarly work and um, even things that, that, that had fiction, brought fictional elements in, everything about the Underground Railroad, really, really studied the history and tried to find her, you know? And I found her. I found her to the point where I felt like I was sitting next to her. So she was an important part of my life for the past two years. Um, and it's been an incredibly enriching experience, honestly. Um, you know, it's... Um, it's really brought me so much joy and um, and and sadness as well because when we study history, you know, it's um, you know, it's it's sad and you can't believe um, what people went through. But the fact what can be accomplished with the sheer force of will is always amazing to me, and and the um, the beauty and the strength of human nature is always amazing to me. So this is one of those stories. It's a good story. Yeah. You know. no, she's a real hero. It's amazing what she was able to accomplish against the odds that she was she was fighting. And uh, there's a, of course, a Canadian uh, uh, angle to this story as well, mm -hmm. seen in in Fort Erie, Ontario. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I can't wait for you guys to see Harriet. But if you've got questions now, let's uh, open it up to you, please. Uh, okay. There's somebody up in the back with a question. We'll go up here first. Uh, please wait for the mic. It's on its way. Hey, Casey. Hi. I can see you very well. <laughs> so? Huh? It's been 22 years okay. since I first saw your first cut. And it's just mesmerizing looking at the original vision that you had for the film itself come alive now in 2019. I'm curious to know, looking at the film, I think about the third life of Grange Copeland, Alice Walker. And I think about texts like that in terms of literature and how I see it in the film. But you also include jazz and blues a lot in terms of the music. So I'm wondering, how does music and literature influence your vision as a filmmaker? Uh, literature was, is, is one of my main influences. So I don't know that. It's, it's amazing how much I miss because I don't uh, watch um, as much television or streaming as, as my students do. I miss a lot, but I read everything. So I've been, I've been re since I was a little kid, it's, I, it's an introvert's um, you know, um, that's where we go. And so I read everything. And um, as, a, as a young person, I was very, very influenced by Southern literature. And, um, and that led me to, it led me to, uh, all roads eventually led to Gabriel Garcia Marquez. <laughs> and, um, and Marquez was a huge influence on the way that I looked at the world. It was, um, it was not so much, oh, I want to look at the world like that. It was like, oh, I look at the world like that. And so I found somebody that um, is speaking to me, Marquez and Toni Morrison. You know, um, I, found, I found writers that were speaking the language or, or had the worldview that I did in terms of the fluidity of um, what's, what we call real and, and not. And so I was very, very heavily influenced by, by literature. I was also heavily in, influenced by my, my elder sister um, and her love of music. So she brought me into music. She really turned, she played me my first Sonny Rowling's album. You know, she played, she played my first Miles Davis um, and Patti, Patti LaBelle. You know, she, she really turned me on to music and, and music became 
just part of my life and part of um, part of the way that I function. And it's interesting because even when I'm not listening to it all the time, uh, which I, I don't now, I have it playing all the time. And so, yeah, the, you, you picked up on two enormous influences for me. Thank you. Who's next? If you're in the back, please wave your hand. Oh, yeah, right down here in the front. Hi. Uh, microphone is on its way. Sorry, we made you go all the way up and now all the way back. <laughs> here she goes. Right here. I was entranced by the child actors. Yeah. Where did you find those three wonderful mm -hmm. actors? Well, it's an interesting story. So um, Megan, who plays Cicely, um, I tried to get the film made for so long that she was Eve. <laughs> she, she was attached as Eve, and she was very, very convincing, and we did readings even with Sam Jackson. The first reading I did with Sam Jackson once he had attached, um, she was reading Eve with the pigtails and everything. Um, but, you know, it, it took a minute, and the next time I saw her, I'm like, She's yeah, she she's Sicily. <laughs> Suddenly, she become this 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 other kind of um, of young woman, and so we needed to. So I thought, you know, she's going to be perfect in this role. She'd been literally she had known the screenplay since she was ten, and so um, now that she was fourteen, you know, I needed to find an Eve. So I'm like, okay, no problem. I'll just find Eve. Um, well, no, <laughs> not not so easy. So um, I got in a situation where I was in Louisiana with a crew scouting and preparing this film, and I didn't have a lead actor. And I started to feel um, like a charlatan. Like, you know, I've led these people down here on the, on the, on the force of my will and my vision, and I don't have an Eve, and I, I don't have an Eve, and I and I obviously have not been um, expressing what I'm looking for clearly enough because these kids would come in and they would be precocious and I would just, oh, you know, that's not what I'm looking for. I don't need a precocious kid. I need this otherworldly quality, you know, an earthiness and an otherworldly quality that I'm looking for in this girl. Did not find her. So my casting, I was, I was in Louisiana prepping. And my casting director, Jackie Brown, called me and said, I think I might have found Eve. You got to fly back to L.A. Um, and see this kid. So I flew back to L.A. and um, I met Journey. And Megan was in the room and Sam was in the room when we auditioned Journey. And Journey was just that kid. You know, she was just a natural, this natural, beautiful kid. And... Um, I fell in love with her and it was very clear she had the quality that I couldn't express that I was looking for. And then I went outside to catch my breath because I was so overwhelmed by her and I, and I saw her brother <laughs> and I said, hey, you, are you Journey's brother? He said, yeah, I'm Jake. I was like, you, do you act? <laughs> I, and uh, I said, come in and improvise with your sister. So he came in and improvised and I was like, okay, those two. And so, uh, so I cast the two of them at once. After I cast them, I, um, you know, Diane Carroll's doing the movie. My first conversation with Diane Carroll, um, she w hadn't joined us yet. And she said, well, who are you going to get to, to play Eve? Mm -hmm. And I said, I just cast this girl, Journey Smollett. And she said, I know Journey. She said, she's a spooky her? little girl. I said, that's <laughs> the only I'm looking for. That was exactly it. You know, she was, she was a little spooky, you know. Well, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you managed to make the shoot dates then <laughs> we managed to we had a cast and i cast her and her brother and uh you know they were wonderful mm -hmm. that's great okay who else has got a question oh right beside and then we'll go up there go ahead i just want to add something to that last uh, last question what became of the child actors they're very very talented oh but they became quite famous um yeah they work all the time <laughs> uh they they work all the time. They they've had they have had big careers, um, but they don't look like that anymore. You know, they they're these gorgeous women, and um, they've had quite wonderful careers. Um, yeah, they 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 have. Mm -hmm. It's a good Google, you know. <laughs> Megan Good and Journey Smollett. Yeah. All right, let's uh, go up up here to the gentleman, and then uh, and then you're next. Thank you. 
Um, I just want to say I really enjoyed the film, and um, the movie hasn't always been an easy easy to get a hold of on video. Um, and I remembered when it came out, you know, the hype around it, and it was so great after finally getting to see it, you know, that it really lived up to that. And I just wanted to ask, you know, the kids were incredible, just incredible. Uh, but, you know, certainly the adult actors you know, were fantastic too. And, and um, you know, I mean, Sam Jackson was, was at the peak of his career and Dan Carroll and everything. I was just wanted to ask um, how you attracted, you know, them to, um, was it to do with just reading the script and, you know, because the plot is really engrossing or if there were other factors that came to them being attached to the project? I like to think that the script was very strong, you know, but um, it was Sam Jackson. <laughs> so and Sam came because um, he he Pulp Fiction had come out, you know, um, but Sam was really a character actor, you know, and and he wanted to play a leading man, you know. He um, I had done a short film uh, to kind of, that had the same some of the same tone as. Um, Eve's Bayou, and it was called Dr. Hugo. And in it, um, Vondi, my husband, played a, a handsome doctor who pays a visit, a house call, to a married lady. And it has a sexiness to it. And so I had the script, and I had this short film, Dr. Hugo. And Sam saw that and said he wanted to play that doctor. <laughs> and so once Sam was there, uh, he was implied. So even if he wasn't sitting physically next to me, I had the presence of Sam Jackson, you know, next to me for 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 meetings. So Sam's attached um, got a lot of people excited. Will there be a Blu-ray? No, I don't think a Blu-ray was ever made. No. It's about time. It's about time. Okay. There was another question here. My, just uh, wait, microphones on its way to you, and then we'll go over here if there's anyone. You can just pass that down, please. Sorry, I, can you tell us a little bit about your opera project? I'm interested. Yeah, in it, it opened this summer. Um, it opened at St. Louis Opera Theater. I've been working on it for a couple of years. So, so this is my fourth movie, Harriet, is my fourth movie with Terrence Blanchard, who did the score for, for Eve's Bayou. So um, Terrence and I, have, over the years, have had a pretty... Um, close collaboration and I'm a huge fan of his. And um, he re he did an opera champion for St. Louis Opera Theater that, that it was a big success. And so uh, they, uh, they asked him to do another opera and he asked me to do the libretto. And so that's how I became a librettist. Uh, you know, we opened the summer and um, it was wonderful. And I think it's going to um, travel, that's what I hear. It's gonna have, it has legs and it's gonna, um, be done by other opera companies, but for me, is is a, you know, is wonderful um, experiment, you know, and uh, different than screenwriting, but yet the same as all writing. And um, yeah, it was beautiful. I really, really enjoyed it, and I really love Fire. I love the opera. It's based on Charles Blow's memoir. Uh, you know yeah. who Charles yeah, Blow? Is. Um, New York Times columnist. Yeah, New York Times columnist who had a very interesting childhood, a difficult childhood. And uh, it's based on his memoir called A Fire Shut Up On My Bones. A lot of filmmakers are, are attracted to opera, mm -hmm. it seems. What, what is it about that particular art form that you think appeals to film directors? I think what I was looking for was um, a, a level of artistic freedom and just kind of uh, expression. I think that um, in terms of screenwriting in Hollywood, I've been working in Hollywood and kind of the the system you know for for a while now and it's been it's, it's I've done you know it's done well by me I've done well by it um but I was looking for just kind of pure expression you know and I thought well this will be totally different than the movie industry mm -hmm. and um and then they called me and said so you need a perp for a soprano <laughs> 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 there's a soprano we we want and I'm like oh it is it's, it's the same it's the same the everywhere same. but you know um <laughs> So, so we have Julia Bullock stars in it. That's wonderful. Do you know her? I don't. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful African American woman mm -hmm. um, who's a soprano, the magnificent soprano. And and so, uh, you know, I ended up. Um, it ended up, but it, it it does. You do it has its stars, and mm -hmm. it's kind of um, not unlike in some ways. You know, it, it, you you have stars to draw an audience, and mm -hmm. um, but it was freeing because in opera anything can sing, and once I really married that concept that anything can sing you know trees can sing and and qualities can sing 
Um, How do you mean? Uh, well, Julia Bullock plays loneliness. She oh. plays his loneliness. Uh-huh. And um, and she also plays destiny. It's a dual role, destiny and loneliness. And, huh. Um, so th- I mean that that's that's a freeing concept. Interesting. Harder to pull off in a movie. Yeah, harder imagine. to pull off in a yes. movie. <laughs> Not impossible though. <laughs> all right. Who else has got a, a question for Casey? Um, over here. Is it all this side of the room? I'm not sure what's going on. <laughs> Go ahead. It was fantastic seeing the film, and I'm I'm so glad that you're here in Toronto. I was wondering about the locations where it was filmed because in some of the locations that felt like a character as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of it was filmed in Madison, Louisiana, um, but some key parts were filmed in a place called Itakapa Landing. That's where Elzora's character lived, you know, where you have these these um, little bridges over the over the, the water. Um, but it, pretty much in deep kind of bayou country um, in Louisiana, which which is almost like cheating because it's so rich and beautiful, and the lo- and it, absolutely the location was a character in the movie and um, we scouted a lot of places um, before I arrived at that place. And um, it was very important to me that the Batiste, um, the Batiste history, that the history of their family was very important to me. And so I didn't want, um, I scouted a lot of slave plantations, but that's not what I wanted. Um, and so I waited for a feeling from the house that I was looking for, and and finally I found the, the, the I found the Batiste house. Also, I knew that I had the last shot in mind because it was in the screenplay. So I needed a house on the um, water, and um, of course, if you live in Louisiana, you build a wall between yourself and the water, right? You you know you build a levee, and you don't um, you're in danger if you if you build a house. That house is still there though, but um, it's a house that's right on the water. And so that was important to me. So I was looking for, you know, a house with a particular vibe on the water. And I found it. Um, it's just, I believe, outside of Madison, Louisiana. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so I, I uh, greatly enjoyed seeing your vision more fully realized. Um, thinking of the context in which it is set, while, well, you know, the family conflict is superbly uh, dramatized. I don't sense the the kind of wider context that would have uh, somehow impacted on a family living in that part of Louisiana in circa 1958, I'm guessing. Yeah, um, I said it in 62, which is like the 50s in the South, you know, because things trends move move slower. Um, Yes, that was for a very particular reason. Um, When I was a little kid, I lived in what I call black world. Like I didn't know, I didn't know from racism. Nobody spent time talking about it. Um, it wasn't part of our lives. Every single person that I knew was black, and they looked like the range of this room. But these were all people of color um, in my life. I, it was just the way I grew up in St. Louis, um, and in St. Louis and Alabama, the communities that I was in, and the people that I knew. Then it had its own, you know, social order, and it had its own hierarchy, and and um. Uh, and they were very glamorous, very, very, very um, intellectual, beautiful people. And I wanted to express what it was like, you know, to go to one of my parents' parties, you know, what it was like and, and what these people were like. And it became very important to me, almost a militant fight. Um, and the more meetings that I took with people that said, why can't you have one white character? Why can't there even be a town racist? <laughs> the more militant I got about the vision. And so there are no white extras in Eve's Bayou. There are no white people in Eve's Bayou. Because, um, because we African Americans have complicated lives and difficult lives and complex relationships and complex family relationships that have nothing to do with white people. And, and you know, we, we, it, 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 there's a way of thinking that that's all we think about is like being oppressed, but that's really not, not true. And, and um, I mean, yeah, that's a huge part of it, but they're just, they're families that are just struggling to be a family, you know, and they're, they're husbands and wives dealing with all kinds of issues. And, and I just wanted to say, this is anybody's family. This is anybody's family. And I wanted to take that weight off of it. Um, 
and and not to be safe, but to be dangerous. You know what I mean? To be, it became like a mission. Yeah, yeah, and that that actually was groundbreaking. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. In the 1990s, it was so rare to see films with an entirely black cast. Um, all right, did we have, yes, there's, I think there's a hand up in the very back. The microphone, microphone's on its way. <laughs> Obviously, congratulations, and just seeing the film again on the big screen properly, and just what you've said about be, it being really this sort of earthy experience, but also a very ethereal and kind of spooky experience at the same time really does resonate. And I'm kind of curious, sort of in the moment while you're making the movie, because I love the elements of voodoo, but also the elements of family, which really strike such a great balance. And I'm kind of curious, was there any sort of external pressure on you as sort of a first time filmmaker at the moment to say, make it more of a genre movie to almost try to make it a little more commercial or accessible at the, in, sort of in the time while you're making it? Not at all. I was um, a unicorn. Nobody had heard of anything like me. I was, uh, you know, there is there is a leaning forward, frankly, you know, when I would walk into a room, I mean, they they were people were interested in my vision. And that's what I pitch to filmmakers. Honestly, it's like if you've got some weird vision that nobody's ever heard of, like pitch it because, you know, they were interested in in what I was what I had to say. It's be, I mean, obviously, it's because the screenplay was strong, but it was also like, huh, there were people that didn't believe that it was authentic. And so I did get that. Um, specifically, even when I was screening it, um, I got reactions to the wardrobe. And it was, it was very interesting because um, specifically, uh, I remember a, a, a white man telling me black people didn't dress like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my line producer was black. And in the beginning party scene, that pearled dress, that's his mother's dress. Mm. You know, so I had to educate people that actually um, I was trying to express something that existed that they knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. And because they knew nothing about it doesn't mean that it didn't exist. So a question right here in the front and then we'll go back here and then we'll go over here. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I felt like I was the little girl at one of my parents' parties. And secondly, I'd like I'm interested in the argument that you heard, the strong suggestion that the uncle in the wheelchair shouldn't be in the movie. Yeah. What was, what, tell, tell us about that. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily something I'm supposed to talk about. <laughs> you know, it's in the contracts and, um, but it, you know, he just didn't like it. The movie was financed by one person. And I think that, um, he liked, I think that there was, to me it was important that there were very beautiful people and that there was something also that, that countered that. You know what I mean? That felt real to me. Um, he, I think he liked, they, they, the beautiful people were important. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna present this strange, kinky little dream of yours, Casey, you know, like, let's, um, let's keep it pretty is, is, um, that's not him talking though. That's that's me kind of um, extrapolating. But I think that you know, they, it, they were they were also beautiful, you know. And then there was Uncle Tommy, but but to me that was that was kind of like what I was trying to say. Let's go over here. Uh, there was a question here, and then we'll come back to you. Um. Ah. Uh. Uh, hi, Miss Lemons. Uh, this was like a really great film. Like, um, what I would like thoroughly, um, probably uh, like relate to was probably the kids' journeys. Um, like throughout the film, like, like these kids would just like suffer like harm and like abuse and, like, what I generally felt was that they wanted to be loved, like no matter what. And why was like their journey through all that pain to like feel that why was it so important to you i mean i think it's it's very um what i was trying to say was simple it, it was um the questions that moved me and the the anger that you could have at um a parent that you adored you know 
um, and the muddiness um, of um, boundaries sometimes. Uh, that, those are things that I wanted to explore. To me, pain is part of, like, like I said, I grew up on literature, you know what I mean? Um, pain is part of, of, of everything artistic that I like. Um, and part of life, you know, so I wasn't trying to avoid that. I was trying to explore it and I was trying to uh, frankly explore my own pain and my own, um, you know, daddy issues and my own uh, grappling with my childhood and the complicated relationships that I didn't understand at the time. Uh, but I knew how I felt about them, you know, and so um, I was interested in a child's perspective of the adult world and the relationship between sisters and um, the influence that one sibling can have over another and um, and the things that a child might not understand and the things that they do understand. That's what I was interested in. Thank you. Thanks, we'll go here and we might have time for one more afterwards. Oh, here. <laughs> <laughs> I thought the photography was amazing. The close-ups and the other the way the camera moved, the lighting. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I was I was specifically looking for um, emotional photography. That's why I described it. I wanted I wanted to I was looking for a cinematographer that was that had an emotionality. And so um, when so when I just when I was looking to make the short film that was going to help me make the feature, I went to AFI and I looked at a bunch of short films made by AFI students. And the, and I, I, I the one that I felt the most, you know, I called that person, and it was a um, a, a young DP named uh, Amelia Vincent, Amy Vincent. Um, so she it was she was a woman, and um, and she had never made a feature, and I had never made a feature, which um, you know it was a miracle that that we were allowed to make a first feature together with neither of us having made one, but we had a very strong producer. Uh, named named Kadi Chubb, and he kept us together. After he saw the short film, he was like, "No, you two have to stay together and and make this this feature because you both understand what you're trying to do." Yeah. How would you characterize the light in that area, that part of Louisiana? Is there something unique about it that you were trying to capture in the film? Because it does feel like it has a special quality. Well, there there's so much um, through foliage. And the foliage is very dense and rich, and the um, the cypress the cypress comes up through the water, you know, and uh, it it's it has a um, the cypress roots are, are black, almost black, and and very striking looking, and then there's this dense green foliage, and the light filters through the trees, and I thought it was uh, incredibly beautiful, and um, but. What is also influencing the way that you see it is the sound of the insects, which is quite uh, quite a symphony, you know. And so, so all of that adds to the texture for me. It's like the way that it sounds in the south, and the way that it lo looks, and the way that it feels, the type of humidity, the type of insects, you know, um, and and the constant drone of insects, um, and just the the humidity. I mean, it would just pour suddenly you know it does, it's been doing that this summer here in toronto mm -hmm. yeah yep. just just <laughs> pouring suddenly and it's like you know the streets are flooded and mm -hmm. then gone and you know in an hour and and dry you know and and um i was trying to capture a feeling from my youth that actually was in alabama mm -hmm. uh the way that things seemed to me so i really was i really was looking at it um there was memoir to it, you know, but it wasn't autobiographical. Mm -hmm. But I was, tr I was trying to capture like a feeling of how it felt to me in the South when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I think one more. I think it's up to you here. It's coming in from this side. Sorry, I just had a question um, with the representation of kind of the the illustration, better said, of the um, African American life, uh, that kind of society. I was having a, kind of the capturing of that sensibility, maybe from I was having flashbacks a little bit of the uh, 
of a book uh, by Andre Leon Talley, which illustrates really well mm-hmm. kind of that life, um, that society, that be- the beauty associated with that society. And I couldn't help but that book being brought to mind throughout it because I feel that you do kind of similar um, or better or that that capturing in on film. Uh, are you familiar with the book? No, I'm not at all. Oh. Um, but but uh, I'm familiar with him. Mm-hmm. Um, he grew up in the South as well. I, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think it's I think it's a lot of people's um, memories of of their parents. You know, that's what I was trying to express. You know, that there was there was there was something I had to offer that I don't think people were used to seeing, um, but that we were used to seeing in our own lives. You know what I mean? Um, and and it, in our own homes. And it was, um, you know. Uh, I, I was seeing, um, you know, the usual you know, g- gangsters or, or sweaty noble people, you know, and I'm um, like, you know, I don't know. They weren't they weren't sweaty and they weren't noble. <laughs> they were kind of just like this. They were humans and they were um, fabulous. Uh, and that's that's what I wanted to express. Can you talk a little bit about what you're doing here in Toronto this summer? The Madam C.J. Walker yeah. story. I don't know if everyone will be familiar with her, but just a remarkable, uh, true story. Yeah. And you're doing, uh, you're contributing to a, uh, a kind of a limited series about her right. as well with Octavia Spencer. Yeah, I'm doing the f- the first two parts of a four part mini series on Madam C.J. Walker. Madam C.J. Walker was the first African American female self made millionaire in America on hair care. Um, it, it, she, she lived in a time, she was, um, born right after slavery. She lived in a time where women, um, African-American women were mostly working as washerwomen, you know, or, or cleaning houses for, for white people. And they, they didn't have time to, to groom. And in fact, uh, even have running water often to wash their hair. And so, um, she started as a washerwoman and, uh, went through a very stressful time where hair fell out and uh, she was kind of rescued by a, a, a woman um, who was selling a uh, hair care product and it, it, it revolutionized, kind of rocked her world and she began making her own formula and um, totally the way that we look at hair these days, African American hair, in the world, but particularly in the States, but no, in the world is really because of Madam C.J. Walker. She kind of revolutionized the way black women um, look at their hair, which of course now is very expressive and, uh, you know, and, and kind of like a thing, you know. Um, we can trace all that back to Madam C.J. Walker, who is the first black hair culturalist um, that, that taught women to groom the proper hygiene and grooming and grew their grew how to grow a natural beautiful head of hair and it's it's this fabulous story of this woman who who literally she was you know born after right after slavery and um very 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 poor a very poor washerwoman and she became a millionaire on the level of enormous million met rockefeller and and um and built a, a mansion like hearst you know what I mean? Like a very, very, very wealthy, wealthy woman. And her daughter became, um, uh, you know, they call her the joy guard goddess of the Harlem Renaissance, mm-hmm. Alelia Walker. She was a very, very prominent figure in the Harlem Renaissance. And they, um, you know, they built literally they like castles um, on hair care. So uh, this is about... It's an amazing but, story. Yeah. <laughs> it's, That's great. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think we're out of time, so I just want to ask you to please join me in thanking Casey Lemons for this beautiful film, Eve's Bayou. You.